Country music hasn't sounded the same over time. It's a regular combination of the Wabash Cannonball. I fell into a burning ring of fire. Yeah, tonight I'm sitting alone, picking up bones. Just give it away. And country music didn't come from one place. It evolved over centuries to what we know today. In fact, country music wasn't even called country music until the 1940s. Before that, the rural southern type of music was called hillbilly music, or folk music if people wanted to be more polite. The melodies and lyrics of this hillbilly music was imported by immigrants from all over the world, but primarily from Europe, as more and more people sail to America. These folk songs, each with their own style and history, found a home and evolved in the musical mixing pot of the rural South into what we now call country music. But in August 1927, almost a hundred years ago, one could say modern country was born through an event called the Big Bang of Country Music. But before we get to that, let's start with a little background. Now in the old days, Southerners, mostly poor, would sit around and play their songs, sometimes on guitars and banjos, but mostly on fiddles. Many songs had no lyrics at all. In fact, the biggest stars of early hillbilly music were musicians, not singers. But when there were lyrics, they reflected the themes and lifestyle of the rural South. Rough, hard, sometimes happy, but mostly hauntingly sad. Crops, trains, heartbreak, sin, God, church, and mama is what the South was made of, and early country music was drenched in those themes just as it is today. Now, when it came time to enjoy hillbilly music, there was really only one option, live music. You either had to play it or to be around someone who was playing it. Church is where most people learn to sing and religious lyrics were often set to popular contemporary melodies. But that music in church was sacred. If you wanted to hear worldly music, you generally attended a barn dance, which is where, well, groups of people danced in a barn. The fiddle player would play for hours as the people of the town danced and sang along. And this was country music until around 1880. But in 1877, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. And over the next 50 years, the phonograph would revolutionize music itself. Music no longer had to be played live. Rather, it could be listened to anytime. And now, when a song was recorded, that version of the song lasted forever. It didn't change and evolve like the songs did over the years when there was no original copy to listen to. Now, Southerners could recognize a song and the person who sang it. Now, a song had a title, lyrics, and an artist. This was the first step to creating our country music stars today. But there was a problem. Recording companies for these phonographs generally recorded songs that city dwellers listened to, mainly orchestra and classical music, not hillbilly music. In fact, for years, the record companies mostly ignored the rural South. And that was until an invention came along that changed the course of country music forever. The radio. Radio exploded on the scene in the 1920s, and by 1930, it is estimated that one out of three American households had a radio. Radio quickly became the primary source of news and entertainment for the American household. Many Southern radio stations from the very beginning played live hillbilly music that was welcomed into millions of homes. Country music went from being played at only small local events to being broadcast throughout the entire South. The reach and popularity of hillbilly music exploded. 
So, after initially ignoring the Southern Hillbillies and their folk style of music, radio showed the phonograph companies just how popular hillbilly music was, and the recording companies changed their minds in a hurry. They wanted to cash in. So recording companies like RCA and Columbia started looking for artists who wanted to record hillbilly music. And they found plenty. Hey there, thanks for watching. If you would, would you take a second to like this video and subscribe to my channel? I'm really trying to get the Stories of Country Music YouTube channel going, and the first part is the hardest because YouTube wants to see some interaction before they'll promote the video even more. So if you would, real quick, like the video and subscribe to my channel, I sure would appreciate it. Thank you. One of the first country recordings was this fiddle tune by Eck Robertson, recorded in 1922, called Arkansas Traveler. <laughs> One of the first hillbilly songs recorded that included lyrics was Little Log Cabin in the Lane by Fiddlin' John Carson. But the angels watched over me when I lay down to sleep in my little old log cabin in the lane. And The Wreck of Old 97, recorded in 1924 by Vernon Dahlhart, was the first country song to sell over a million copies. Turns out, there was plenty of talent spread amongst the hills and valleys of Southern America. It was just a matter of finding them. And that's where Ralph Peer came in. Now, Ralph was basically a record producer, and he wanted a raise by his bosses, but he got turned down. Instead, he was offered a one-cent royalty per record side he recorded, one of the first music royalties ever. So, being a shrewd and intelligent businessman, he became a talent scout, scouring the country for new artists he could record and profit from. Instead of forcing the hillbilly artists to come to New York City to record, which greatly limited the talent pool that could record, he decided to go to them. And the result of one such scouting trip that landed in Bristol, Tennessee, would result in what is called the Big Bang of country music. The Bristol Sessions, as they would be known, is where modern country music started. Now, on this particular trip, Ralph visited Atlanta, Savannah, Memphis, and Bristol, and recorded literally hundreds of songs along the way. But in one of the great coincidences in country music history, he recorded songs from the first stars of country music within two days of each other in the very same building. First, the Carter family, and then Jimmy Rogers. So just how big were the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers to country music history? Well, let's take a look. The Carter family recorded songs such as Wabash Cannonball, Keep on the Sunny Side, and the song you still hear to this very day in country music, can the circle be unbroken? Can the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and The by Carter family was country music's first famous family. And they were one of the first to commercialize hillbilly music, selling hundreds of thousands of records. The Carter family sold so many records that they realized the financial possibilities of their music and started writing and copywriting other people's hillbilly songs, becoming one of the first to do so. In summary, the Carter family was a forerunner in the mass commercialization of country music. And of course, Maybell Carter, a member of the Carter family, had a daughter named June Carter, who would herself win five Grammys and would change her name to June Carter Cash after marrying Johnny Cash. And this is the legacy of the Carter family. Now, let's look at Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy Rogers recorded in Bristol right after the Carter family. Jimmy became known as country music's first singing star and 
the father of modern country music. Jimmy was the first hillbilly artist to become famous for his voice. Now back then, most hillbilly artists focused on the music, the fiddles, guitars, and banjos. And while some artists did sing, their focus was still on the music. But Jimmy turned the hillbilly world upside down. Jimmy's voice could do amazing things. It was part folk, part blues, part black, and well, part yoga. The singing style was so diverse and unique, people had never heard anything like it before. And they fell in love with Jimmy Rogers. in a sense Elvis Presley before Elvis. You remember Elvis came along and sang like nobody had ever sang before and moved like nobody had ever moved before. Elvis turned music on its head. Well, Jimmy Rogers did the same thing in the 1920s. Gene Autry, Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, Merle Haggard, Tanya Tucker, and Dolly Parton are just a few country stars to credit Jimmy Rogers for influencing their own music. That's how big of a deal Jimmy Rogers is. He truly was country music's first star. Now, sadly though, Jimmy Rogers was diagnosed with tuberculosis at the age of 27 and passed away at an incredibly young 35 years old. There is absolutely no telling how big Jimmy Rogers would have been had he lived through World War II when country music exploded into the national mainstream. Jimmy Rogers was so important to country music that he was part of the very first class inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. So there you got it. The Bristol Sessions in August 1927. The Big Bang of Country Music. The two biggest stars of early country music, the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers, coincidentally recorded in the same building within just days of each other. So where did country music go from there? How did the Grand Ole Opry start? And how did Nashville, Tennessee become the center of country music? Well, I'm glad you asked that and we'll get to it, but that's a story for another day.